podcast, everybody, a podcast for movie fans ranging from the biggest blockbusters to hair-raising horror films. My name is Jose Ramos Jr., and if you enjoy talking about movies as much as I do, then you've come to the right place. On today's episode, we will be revisiting some of my favorite Christmas movies of all time. But before we begin, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, J Area Podcast, and follow the podcast on Spotify and join the J Area. I know in the last few episodes, I've been revisiting and recapping and reviewing some of my favorite movies of all time, but I thought with this episode, what would be fun is just to go down some of my favorite Christmas movies of all time. You know, not not to dissect them not in terms of the story, in terms of what they mean to me and my family. And, and so for this first movie, it's a movie that they play on TV every year. In fact, they just played it the other day and I was watching it with my mom. Um, it's Christmas with the Cranks. It stars Tim Allen and Jamie Lee Curtis. I'll be providing a short synopsis for each of these films just to give you an idea of what they're about, just in case you haven't seen it. And according to IMDb, quote, With their daughter Blair away in Peru, Luther and Nora Crank decide to skip Christmas altogether until she decides to come home, causing an uproar when they have to celebrate it at the last minute. I know that this movie, in terms of popularity and success, isn't necessarily up there in terms of Christmas movies. But it has a special spot in my heart because it's a movie that my family has always enjoyed watching. It's something that is a topic of discussion every time we talk about the holidays. And at least once or twice the holiday season, there's some kind of reference to a line or to a scene that happens in this movie. Tim Allen is very popular in our, in our household, especially you know being that he was in the Toy Story franchise. You know, There's Ho- Home Improvement as well, which was a show that I had watched growing up. Um, and Jamie Lee Curtis, again, for another reason, um, is very popular in the household as well for her contributions to the horror franchise Halloween. Um, I know growing up with you know, the Disney Channel original movies, Freaky Friday was very popular too, um, which she starred in with Lindsay Lohan. But this movie, in essence, is just about a family who tries to skip Christmas. It's based on a novel, Skipping Christmas, um, and it's it's very diverse in the sense that most holiday movies are about, you know, the holiday season, keeping cheer, celebrating, being with their families. And this one is what happens when a family really isn't together. You know, their daughter, Blair, is away in Peru, as I mentioned. And as a means to save money, Tim Allen's character, Luther, thinks, you know, well, what if we do something different? What if we do something for ourselves? Obviously, they know that Christmas isn't going to be the same without their daughter. So he invites Nora out to a cruise, and essentially they are the the epicenter of their neighborhood. And it's a conversation that I had with my mom while watching it, just how frustrating and annoying the people in the town are, that they, they have no life because everything essentially revolves around the cranks and their Christmas party. So when Luther and Nora go about their lives and start informing people like, hey, we're not going to be doing a Christmas party. We're not going to be needing Christmas cards nor Christmas invitations because said party is not going to happen. The whole town turns its back on them and they begin giving them these dirty looks, pointing fingers. And to the point where one of Nora's friends um, asks her, well, then if you're not going to have a party, what are we going to do for Christmas? And it's like they can do whatever they want for Christmas. I think in the sense the movie itself is trying to kind of paint Luther and Nora as like these Scrooge-esque characters who are just skipping Christmas and are anti-holiday. I don't know if that's just me, but personally, I look at them as the protagonists. It's their decision. Whatever they want to do with their holiday is totally up to them. But you see everybody else in the neighborhood just reveal to them that they have no life. And I know that might sound, you know, you know, crude and, and rude, but if you watch this movie, as many times as I have watched it, you pick up on little nuances and little details of the neighborhood. And I think Luther and Nora are just as justified. Their daughter's not going to be there, you know. And Christmas is a time for family. So if she's going to be in Peru doing whatever she has to do involving her, you know, her studies. Nor- Luther and Nora have every right to spend their holiday the way they want to. Now, it's only as a result of Blair announcing that she's coming home for Christmas. Now that enters the, the the ordeal where it's like, okay, now we have to celebrate Christmas because she's coming. But I just don't like the narrative that like they're bad people for skipping Christmas. If you choose to celebrate your holiday that way, you are more in your rights to do that. And it's a fun movie because of Tim Allen and Jamie Lee Curtis's their, their performances. They're over the top. They're funny. And basically the, the essence of the story 
is just being with your family, regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what you're doing for the holiday. It's all about family. It's all about spending time with the ones you love and doing what means most to you. And again, in terms of popularity, it may not be up there in terms of the best Christmas movie of all time. In fact, it's not even the best Christmas movie that Tim Allen's been in because my next movie would be uh, The Santa Claus, which was released in 1999, of course, stars Tim Allen. And it's when a man inadvertently makes Santa fall off of his roof on Christmas Eve. And this man finds himself magically recruited to take his place. Now, with this franchise, and it is a franchise because there are a total of three films and now two seasons of a spinoff television show on Disney+, Plus. Um, for me, it's just the original. I can watch the second one. I can watch the third one. I've, I've seen the first season of The Santa Claus. Um, but the first movie in itself is just a classic. It's, it's what established our love for Denny's um, in my household, as well as a lot of classic Christmas songs that appear throughout this movie. But, uh, you know, Scott Calvin who is the character that Tim Allen portrays, is an executive of a a toy company. It's his job to sell toys to to children and parents, essentially. And it's a business. And it's interesting to see how we take an individual who's not really that much into the Christmas spirit, but is much more into the profit and business side of Christmas, which, of course, would be the most profitable time of year for a toy company. And, and to place him in this position of now being the most magical person of all time, essentially, in Santa Claus. And the relationship that he has with his son, even though he has a divorce in the family, so he has to you know, basically combat for spending time with his son. And to see, over the course of this film, how he's able to change his mentality, change his perception on not only Christmas, but just on life. And you see this, basically this unpleasant individual, this self-centered person who has to make excuses, who, who lies day in and day out to his ex-wife and to his son, and, and, you know, eventually. And now seeing him evolve into what Kris Kringle, what Saint Nick essentially is in Santa Claus. I think the Santa Claus as well is a classic tale of the notion, and it's a line that they throw out in the movie, you know, a few times, but that... That believing is seeing, and seeing isn't believing. And I think that's such a, a well, well-said well point, that especially in the, in the eyes of, of a young child, in the innocent eyes of a child, um, just because you can't see something doesn't mean it isn't there. And that's what they try to teach Scott Calvin in this, that although you can't see it, that doesn't mean it's not there. And I think, if, you know, if I were to ever have children... The Santa Claus is certainly a film that I would sit down and show them in in the essence of of Christmas, of course, and and the and the lore that the character that the individual Santa Claus brings, because I think the character should bring everyone together. He is it, it may not be the main point of Christmas, but you cannot deny that he is certainly up there with the concept or the image of what represent what what representing christmas really is of course there's another individual who people will argue and that's totally okay but in the eyes of an innocent child santa claus is that representation and from one innocent child to another that brings me to our third movie and that is starring will ferrell elf i will go on the record in saying that i'm not the biggest will ferrell fan not to say that his comedy isn't funny it's just not my cup of tea it's not my my style But I will say, by far, his best movie, my favorite Will Ferrell movie, is Elf. It's directed by Jon Favreau, who I'm a big fan of for his work in Iron Man, for his work in the Mandalorian series. I think it's just a fun movie. Um, The synopsis is, quote, Raised as an oversized elf, Buddy travels from the North Pole to New York City to meet his biological father, Walter Hobbs, who doesn't know he exists and is in desperate need of some Christmas spirit. Again, Combining what we saw with the Santa Claus and kind of flipping it on its head where it's not necessarily the North Pole teaching Scott Calvin, but it's Buddy the Elf teaching his father, Walter Hobbs, what the spirit of Christmas is. I think it's a funny movie. There are multiple scenes in my head that I could quote on a daily basis. For example, when a phone rings and someone answers it, I still have that image of Buddy the Elf answering that, Buddy the Elf, what's your favorite color? Will Ferrell really portrays Buddy the Elf 
in such a way where it comes off naturally. And I'm not to say that he's some kind of blubbering idiot who's a grown, oversized man-child. But it's just he has this likable personality in the role where you kind of do sympathize with the character that all he wants is to spend time with his father and also spread Christmas cheer. But that naive innocence that he has makes for some of the most comical moments in the movie. For example, there's the conversation he has at the department store in the mall where Santa is coming to town. And it's one of those Santa Clauses that comes and you take a picture with him and, you know, the Santa Claus at the mall. And and Buddy the Elf, you know, Will Ferrell, freaks out screaming that Santa Claus is coming. He says, I know him. I know him. And it's just that, that reaction where he goes so over the top, but it's enough dedication to the character where it's funny. And again, he meets that Santa Claus and he sees him and he, and he knows it's not the Santa Claus that he recognizes. So he leans in. And keep on, this is in the middle of, of a kid sitting on Santa Claus's lap. This is in the middle of that. And he looks at him and he says... I know who you are. He says, you sit on a throne of lies. And again, it's just that seriousness, that dedication to the character, to the role, and, and the over-the-topness that just, it gets me laughing every single time. Of course, there's a scene, too, where he like picks off gum off the street and is um, and chews on it, thinking it's like random candy for them to have. Um, if you're not a fan of Will Ferrell, I, I definitely suggest you check out Elf, especially for the holiday season. It's a fun movie for the whole family. And if you are a Will Ferrell, then I have no doubt in my mind that you do love this movie because I think it's one of his best. Now, from another, you know, comedian and a, a drastically different style of comedy, I said that Will Ferrell wasn't necessarily my cup of tea. But the one comedian or, or comedic style, I should say, um, that I am a fan of is Jim Carrey. And Jim Carrey, in the year 2000, starred as the Grinch in the film How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And then as for the short synopsis, it's on the outskirts of Whoville lives a green revenge-seeking Grinch who plans to ruin Christmas for all the citizens of the town. Like I mentioned, with these uh, Christmas movies, there's always some kind of message uh, revolving around the Christmas spirit, revolving around Christmas and, and love and family. And this one tells it from the perspective of the antagonist, essentially. Um, again, it kind of leans towards that the Santa Claus where we follow the egotistical jerk who thinks he's bigger than the holidays himself. But it tells it from from the perspective of Dr. Seuss character. And I think I have to applaud the the makeup department and the art department because what they do in this film is fantastic. They really build Whoville as this real tangible town where you could actually believe that this was a this was a real thing and it wasn't a set. And I love the design of the characters in, in the placement of the noses and the way they place these prosthetic uh, masks on each individual, really capturing the imagery that Dr. Seuss provided in his books way a long time ago. But it's the character and the performance of Jim Carrey that carries this film, essentially. He had, again, so many quotable, memeable, and, and just outlandish moments in this movie that live in my mind for the last 23 years. Um, whether it's him trying to get ready and get dressed and going through the mirror and, and not liking what he sees. And he says, okay, that's it. I'm not going. It's moments with the little girl, Cindy Lou. And and again, just, just the overall look that they give the Grinch. And, and again, his performance, Jim Carrey, is so iconic that whenever you see a character dressed up as the Grinch, it's that performance. It's, it's, it's Jim Carrey. Everyone does their best Jim Carrey impersonation. And I think he really lends himself to the role but also kind of disguises it in the sense of like a Johnny Depp. And for when I say that, it's because for the longest, Johnny Depp from like the 90s to the 2000s would place himself in the role. Well, not maybe not just in the 90s and 2000s, but that's just the first thing I thought of. But he would lend himself to a role to the point where you didn't recognize him. There was a point when I was growing up as a young teen and I would talk to my mom because she was such a huge Johnny Depp fan that I would say, you know, I don't think I know what Johnny Depp actually looks like because he starred in films like um, the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, the Willy Wonka movie, um, the, the Sweeney Todd, he was in Tim Burton's Edward Scissorhands. Like, he was in so many roles where he had, you know, makeup and prosthetics and just these outlandish and unique looks to his character where you didn't know what he looked like. And I think one of the first movies that I saw him in and and kind of realize oh maybe this is what he looks like with secret window because it was he would just play this average writer 
And and when, what I'm getting with this is that Jim Carrey, although you see these moments where it's like, oh yeah, that's Jim Carrey, because of his his physical performance and the prosthetics and makeup that they place on him, he really dives into this role of the Grinch, where it's no longer Jim Carrey, it's the Grinch. It certainly is one of my favorite Jim Carrey performances, and, and for that reason, I have to put it on my list as one of my favorite Christmas movies. Um, but this one more so is one that I really enjoy. It's something I can't really get my whole family to watch, and I think it's because of the over-topness, over-the-topness. Um, but it's that sense of dedication to the role that I love, and it just brings me back in a sense of nostalgic where I can go back to when I was a kid. And speaking of a kid, this is a movie that I think we all can agree, not just in my family, but just everyone in general, we can agree is one of the best Christmas movies of all time. Of course, you know him, Macaulay Culkin, Kevin McAllister. It is the first Home Alone movie released in, in the early 1990s. And it's about an eight-year-old troublemaker mistaking left Home Alone and must defend his home against a pair of burglars on Christmas Eve. I think this movie certainly is in my top three Christmas movies of all time, and the other two I will get to in a moment. Uh, but Macaulay Culkin as Kevin McAllister in this movie is an iconic performance. It, it's a career-defining performance. And when I say that, you can take it as, as two things. You can take it as, wow, he peaked when he was like eight years old. Or you can look at it as, man, this guy was eight years old and he gave one of the greatest like child performances. Not just child performances, but just iconic performance in general. I think that this movie goes down as one of the most fun movies ever made. I think it's one of the best Christmas movies ever made. I certainly think it's Macaulay Culkin's best movie ever made. And there's just so many moments throughout this film that stick with you, especially that with uh, the Wet Bandits. Joe Pesci, and it's going to kill me, but I don't know the name of the other actor who plays his accomplice, but just the banter between those two characters is just phenomenal. Uh, Joe Pesci in itself he is a real good actor in this movie. I find him so funny. His delivery and, and his interaction with uh, Macaulay Culkin, again, just really entertaining, really fun stuff. So many movies, I think, try to replicate what this movie has done in terms of the, the comedy aspect. But no, it's hard to replicate. It's hard to duplicate. And you certainly have to look at this movie as one of the best films, I think, ever made. And just to think, the poise that that this character has and then the, all things aside like we're talking about in the movie now the poise that kevin McAllister has to be able to develop and set up all these traps as a means to defend his home against these two burglars i mean this is some next level stuff he's just a kid i don't know where he's seeing it from they do say that kids have these wonderful imaginations but this was next level like he could develop the next you know level of defense for any home security system forget a ring light or forget a ring camera kevin McAllister probably has the technology and the wits about him to develop some of the greatest defense mechanisms of all time i will die on that hill i will continue to to like to link the the connection between him and john kramer and the saw franchise i love that that fan theory so much that some people think that macaulay culkin's kevin McAllister and john kramer somehow are inter interwebbed and, co and connected. Um, of course they're not, but that's just a very interesting fan theory to come up with. I, I personally think it's one of the best movies ever made. I know certainly it's one of the best Christmas movies. Um, another one, in no particular order, um, another one of my favorite top three Christmas movies of all time has to be Jingle All the Way, uh, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sinbad. I think, again, the movie itself is timeless. It's about a father who vows to get his son a Turbo Man action figure for Christmas. However, every store is sold out, and he must travel all over town and compete with everybody else in order to find one. This is a tale as, told, this is a tale as old as time, in that he is trying to get his son what he wanted for Christmas so bad, and any parent knows that feeling, where they, they just want to give their kid the best Christmas, they just want to give them the best gift that they can, and by no means is he a bad person, um, but Arnold in this movie kind of neglects his family. He goes for his work. And, I mean, I'm not going to blame the guy. You know, I mean, you, your your responsibility is to help provide for this family. And how do you do that? You work. But I will say him going about forgetting certain things in his life is definitely a no-no. And he needs to have his priorities straight. But the uh, the adventure that we embark on with 
with Arnold in this movie is certainly timeless. I have so much fun with this movie. It's certainly one of his more quotable films. Um, and just the cast of characters that are in this movie. You know, you, you see uh, so many so many characters in this movie that, that kind of outshine the scene that they're in. You can easily turn to the warehouse where there was a bunch of the Santa, the, the con man, as Arnold would refer to them. Um, definitely as, as one of those those instances i think ted the neighbor certainly steals the show every time he's on screen i think he's hilarious um certainly in the scenes where he's making advances towards arnold's wife in this movie and eventually he does get his comeuppance you know towards the end of the film but jingle all the way again and it has another good soundtrack of christmas movies where it's like it's one of those movies you can leave in the background you can enjoy it as background noise you can enjoy it as a main movie that you're watching with the family um, Arnold Schwarzenegger was on a roll in the 90s in terms of the films he was putting out, whether it was family related, whether it was action, certainly one of the bigger stars Hollywood has ever seen to the point where he even became a governor of California. But as I get it sidetracked real quick, um, Jingle All the Way, just a fun movie. I know this is a movie that it was, it was meant for everybody in our family. You know, I had younger siblings who were, again, they were just kids, so they just wanted to see something Christmas related and something funny. My mom always loved having the family together, just watching a movie. And then there's, you know, me and my dad, who were huge um, action hero fans. So seeing Arnold in a Christmas movie, I mean, come on, that's the cherry on top. And it won't be the only action star in a Christmas movie that you'll see on my list. Um, but again, for those who haven't seen it, which I would think is like a very, you know, small amount of people, just because this movie is running on 30 years pretty soon um, of its release date. And the fact that it's Arnold, I would like to think a lot of people have seen this movie. I think it's one of the best Christmas movies. It's certainly on my top three, as I mentioned, between Home Alone and this one. But I have to give it up to the final film of this episode. And the reason I left it as the last movie to talk about is because I know it can be a little bit of a controversial topic. Which is why the final, li final movie on my list is Bruce Willis and Alan Rickman in Die Hard. I don't care what anybody says. I think it is a Christmas movie. I know there are so many other people who would agree with me that it is a Christmas movie. But the movie is about a New York police officer trying to save his estranged wife and several others as they are taken hostage by terrorists during a Christmas party at the Nakatomi Plaza in Los Angeles. The question that always comes up every single holiday season is, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? For me, if you want to define something as a Christmas movie, Christmas has to be a part of the plot. It has to be a part of the story. You can't just have Christmas in the backdrop and have no consequence, have no type of uh, you know level of relevance to the, to the story and not be a Christmas movie. It's a Christmas party. Why is Bruce Willis at the Nakatomi Tower? Because it's a Christmas party that he was invited to by his wife, Holly. If it was not a Christmas party, would Bruce Willis be there? That is a part of the story. That is an integral part of the story, hence why it is a Christmas movie. You want Christmas music? It's there. You want white snow? It's also there. You want an important lesson to teach the young kids, to teach the young viewers? It is also there. And the lesson in this movie, of course, is that Bruce Willis trying to protect his wife, trying to do the right thing and save the holiday spirit. And if that's not Christmas, then I don't know what is. I rank it as my number one favorite Christmas movie. That might not be a popular decision or a popular choice, and that's okay. But recognize that it is a Christmas movie. It's my favorite Bruce Willis movie of all time, certainly. And just the, again, the iconic lines, the iconic moments, Die Hard is up there in cinema in terms of one of the best movies ever made. I think it's the best action movie ever made. And I think you have to give its flowers and give its respect that, yes, it is a Christmas movie. And that's the hill I'm going to die on. That is the hill I'm going to fight on. And if you guys enjoyed this episode of the J.R.A. Podcast, please let me know what your favorite Christmas movie is. Do you think Die Hard is a Christmas movie or do you disagree? Be sure to comment your opinion down in the comments section. And please follow the podcast on YouTube and Spotify at the J Area Podcast. And if you're not already subscribed, please do so in order to join the conversation. Until the next episode, my name is Jose Ramos Jr. And this has been the J Area Podcast. 
Happy holidays, everybody.